I want to uh, draw your attention to a very short passage of Scripture found in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. It's only uh, four verses, beginning with the 14th verse. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Would you pray with me? Father, for this time together, we give you thanks for bringing hearts and minds to learn more of you. We give you thanks. We pray for the courage that Sissy spoke about. We pray for wisdom. We pray that you will allow us the wise use of our time so that when that day comes, Father, there will be great joy in the kingdom of heaven because we were here on this occasion. If there are ears to hear, let them hear. If there are minds to understand, let them understand. And if there are your words to speak, let me speak them, Father. We ask all of this in the blessed name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. There, there is, I believe, hidden within this short passage of Scripture, a mandate from God for Christ's church and each of us as Christians who are embedded in the culture of this great nation that we call America. You see, this is the time and the tide in the affairs of our nation when Christians must, cut, must actually choose whether or not we will seek the way of the Lord. Or will we turn to some other path which ultimately will lead our nation to a certain and sudden destruction? In the book of Ezekiel, it is recorded that the pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, came to a parting of the ways and the road in which he was traveling, and there he stopped to seek guidance, divine guidance, as to which way he should take the thrust of his kingdom. If that pagan king of long ago would stop to seek divine inspiration, should we not, as Christians in America also, be about that same business. There's a poignant passage found in the book of Ezekiel, verse, or chapter 22, verse 30, that really frames this question for us as Christians in today's market. Speaking through the prophet, the Lord declared this. He said, I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I am not so foolish to believe that mere words will inspire us to action, even those of a prophet of God. There's a story told of a small Baptist church up in the hills of Kentucky. Pastor Hogg, wherever you are, I apologize in advance. And this little church fell into extremely ill repair. There was, however, no effort forthcoming on the part of the congregation to meet any of the repairs despite the consistent and constant pleas of the pastor. Until during one week, a large piece of plaster fell in the exact place, in the exact pew that the chairman of the board of deacons normally sat on Sunday morning. And it was this point in time when there was a hastily called business meeting for the express purpose of renovating the entire sanctuary. Folks, the ceiling of our great country is sagging and may very well fall at any moment. 
And we, like Jonah of old, are asleep, oblivious to what is going on around us. The real question for us this evening is, will the ceiling have to completely fall in on our heads before we awaken to meet the opportunities that God is placing before us? Right now, at this specific point in time, the challenge of Christian faith, the call of God, and human events have come together in the lives of Christians everywhere, and it's come alive in the life of Southern Evangelical Seminary. We must rouse ourselves and gird ourselves for the fray for, with all the armor of faith and righteousness. We need to get ready to do battle not with each other, but with the evil forces which now pervade our culture. In our scripture, Paul called on the Ephesians to wake up and motivate themselves to meet the challenge of what he calls evil days. And his words still ring true to us today. For if we should be too faint of heart or too weak of resolve to commit ourselves to bold and fearless efforts for Christ's sake in our day and time, then there will be a tremendous loss, not only for God's kingdom here on earth, but for us as individuals as well. I really like how the Williams translation renders verse 14 when it says this, Arise, sleeper, wake from the dead, and Christ will make day dawn on you. These are words, rise, sleep, arise, sleeper, are words that we as individual Christians really need to hear, and Christ's church needs to hear these deep within the roots of who we are. This ringing challenge of Paul to the church at Ephesus contained in these few verses of Scripture that I just read for you this evening smash against the walls of ease that we have created so carefully constructed around us. As part of the body of Christ, we have become so preoccupied with the comforts of our culture that our kingdom efforts have been reduced to nothing more than stroking the trophies of long ago victories. We recall the memories of how things used to be and we encase them in the trophy cases and we refuse to accept any new challenge from God that would cause us to be about the business of fulfilling his great commission of going into the world and making disciples of all men. Hear me well, if you don't take anything away from this conference this weekend, know this, the good times really are over for good, and they're not coming back. We're living in a day of a new paradigm brought on by the infiltration of what I call a godless gobbledygook of Marxist philosophy that's hidden behind the curtains of diversity and sexual hedonism, racial division, and overreaching government intrusion into the very freedoms that you enjoy as Americans. Rod Dreher in his book, Live Not By Lies, says that in the West today we are living under decadent, pre-totalitarian conditions not unlike what existed in Russia and Germany just prior to the takeover of those countries by an all-controlling despotic government during the last century. Regardless of that, make no mistake, the church in America and Christian educational institutions and other Christian institutions of all kinds are already in the crosshairs of this dark movement, as are those already in Canada, in Europe, and Australia, and all over the globe. This crowd will not stop with simply the rendering or the neutering of the gospel and your First Amendment rights under your Constitution but rather it is seeking the gospel's full and utter destruction along with its remaining influence 
being wiped from the face of the earth. C.S. Lewis succinctly described this unparalleled cultural juggernaut when he simply stated, be sure you know that this world is the enemy for the Christian. The time has long since passed for us as Christians to shake off the shackles of our lethargy, to put aside our sluggishness, and to rise up from our graves of idleness. Then and only then will Christ, as Paul says, make day dawn on us. Now this term evil days that Paul uses is a particular term, and it is necessary for us to understand what Paul means when he says evil days. Sitting here in the comfort this evening of this air-conditioned, control, climate-controlled sanctuary, we really know, don't we, that within our hearts of hearts that there's something desperately wrong in our country. As you and I look around our world today, we know in our hearts that we're living in days just as evil as those Paul described in his letter to the Ephesians. They are evil in the sense of external and internal strife. They are evil in a, side, in a sense of a time which is unfavorable to Christian witness. They are evil in the sense of a time when people, as Paul says, conduct themselves as fools. They are evil in the sense of a time when crazed fanatics are securing the allegiance of, the, under, of all the masses under the guise of a religion which is fashioned by a demonic culture and has no basis in the cross of Jesus Christ. As one good pastor has said, we legalize sin and call it good. We prefer sexuality and call it choice. We mock God and call it freedom. Ultimately, too often the response of the American church has been to produce assembly line Christians that have been pre-programmed with a computer glitch of compromise in their DNA. The result is the creation of a pseudo-Christianity that is not totally obliterated, but rather is in grave danger of being changed to the point of being only a self-focused message that seeks the approval of man more than it fears God. In Jeremiah 5, 30, and 31, the prophet plainly speaks to the nation of Israel and his words ring true to us in this generation in America as well when he says this, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule in their own direction. And my people love to have it so. But what will they do when the end comes? Paul says that during these times when people are given to senseless folly and senseless actions, there's a special kind of thing that we as God's people must be doing. He says, open your eyes to what is happening around you and act as wise people, as people who have good sense. In times like these, we must conduct ourselves as children of light. In essence, Paul called on the Ephesians to do three things in the effort to express God's call in their lives for their day, and I believe these things to be just as valid for us today. First of all, Paul says, be careful how you walk. Literally, watch how you live. When you face evil days, you must first and foremost look to your own walk with Christ. Place the highest priority in your existence on living an irreproachable Christian life. Be slow to anger, quick to forgive, reasonable, loving, and moderate in your reactions to all that is said and done. Do not give in to the cultural pressures to conform to a lesser faith than the gospel of Jesus Christ as set forth in the scriptures. We must live so that no one can doubt the solidity of our relationship to Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. 
Secondly, Paul says that we must make the most of our opportunities. We must redeem the time. You see, God's time is a precious and priceless commodity. And he calls on you and me to invest our opportunities in everything that is worthwhile. The wise use of time means being alive and alert to every opportunity that comes our way for Christian ministry and witness. We must seize the critical moments as they come and be prepared to proclaim with our words and with our actions God's love for all people so that the masses will know and will have no choice but to say these people are truly Christians. Our God hears the cries of those living and dying without Christ and without hope, and we are called, therefore, to the same task to which he sent Jesus. The time has long since passed for us as Christians to look beyond our own selfish concerns and agendas and to fix our gaze on Jesus. We have to care about the whole world just as Jesus did. We have to see through his eyes the utter decay and the foundation on which our world and our lifestyle has been built. We have to see our own fellow fellow human beings being twisted by all sorts of cancers like divorce and alcohol and drugs, not even to mention the abominable crimes that are being committed against our children as we sit here this evening through the physical, mental, and sexual abuse and gender mutilation of even our young. We must feel in our own bellies the pain of one of God's precious creations being killed simply as a means of birth control. We have to look behind the screens of our TV sets and our cell phones and our computers and see a world that exists beyond the earphones where deviant sex and alcohol and drugs and violence are promoted to our children simply to see, to sell them some piece of merchandise or worse yet, to steal their very souls. A George Barner study was released just this week and it shows that 76% of Christian parents in America are terribly afraid that their children will lose their faith. Folks, our children and our grandchildren are our greatest mission field. It's time we acted like it. We have to see through the eyes of Jesus, the terror of a world where millions of dollars are being spent every minute on a worldwide scale for wars and preparations of wars and often for the ultimate purpose of enslavement or genocide. And we must hear, if it is not too late to hear, the agonizing cry of a single soul bound to an eternal hell. We must see with bifocal vision, if you will, Christ as he dwells within us and Christ as he dwells beyond us in a world that's divided by greed and hunger and violence and ignorance and false religion and a culture which is directly opposed to the message of the gospel. For if we have not seen the Savior in love with the whole world, regardless of who is there, then we haven't seen the real Savior. Our God is looking for men and women who will be steadfast in the faith. And Southern Evangelical Seminary stands ready this evening to be in the forefront of preparing them to take on this ultimate task of proclaiming the truth to our nation, and for Christ's church around the globe. We will be the champion for Christ's church. 
But if we say tonight that we are telling the truth and we do so without love, then we're not telling the whole truth. In a recent sermon, Shane Eidelman, I don't know this young gentleman, but I just found this. He's pastor of Westside Christian Fellowship of Leona Valley, California, and he said this. Confrontation must come from gentleness and genuine concern. The cry of the prophet must be birthed in the labor room of brokenness. We have no business trying to convict without loving or preaching without weeping. Some folks claim they are defending the truth, but they're actually strengthening the enemy by their arrogance. So in all love, I say to you, those who might be interested in studying at Southern Evangelical Seminary or just simply attending this conference, if your interest lies only in becoming a member of God's debate team, I would prefer you go somewhere else for your theological studies. However, if it is your fervent desire to penetrate this culture for the gospel of Jesus Christ, then not only are you a bright hope for the kingdom of God, but we need you here as SES. Now there's a third imperative that Paul speaks to at the sleeping church in Ephesus. He says, understand what the will of the Lord is. We can ill afford to let our religious lives be only a periodic explosion of emotion. We have to come to grips with our faith, with all of our heart and soul and mind, and that simply calls for more time alone with the Savior. These times that we find ourselves in, they're too troublesome. The stakes are too high for some quick response to an emotional plea. Now, these times that we're involved with call for mental anguish, for wrestling within our souls and within our minds as to what the will of God is for us in this particular day. We can no longer afford to hide our rebellion under the skirts of our religion. Every last person within earshot of my voice this evening must make the decision right now, at this moment, as to when and how they will use what they have for the kingdom of God. Well, the question then arises, obviously, is what is the will of God for my life, for the lives of God-fearing Christians all over the world? There are some things that we know from Scripture, from the Word of God, and from our own Christian experience that are, without a doubt, the will of God. First of all, we know that it is God's will that every human being on the face of this earth, uh, on the face of this earth, should be saved. Not one single person should be lost. Secondly, we know that it is God's will that all those who believe in His Son be allowed to develop an unreserved personal commitment to Jesus Christ, and who then can become effective witnesses to testify to the love of God to man through the life, death, and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. We know that it is God's will that we be good stewards of all that God has placed in our hands, and that all we have must be placed at His discretion. We know that it is God's will that everyone who comes to follow His way be nurtured and trained in the Christian faith through the inerrant and in the infallible Word of God so that they will be able to immediately and boldly give a reason for the hope that lies within them. And finally, we know that it is God's will that all those who call themselves Christians should adhere to a decidedly Christian lifestyle. So I'm saying to you this evening that the adversity of these times will not excuse any of us from utilizing every opportunity and embracing every challenge that comes our way. Just as Jesus loved each of us and gave himself for each of us as a fragrant, fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, so we must too live our lives and place our lives on the altar of Christ. We must learn the hard facts in this nation that truth cannot be separated from tears and that living in truth 
may well require the acceptance of suffering. Make no mistake about it. We can dialogue with this culture until we're blue in the face. We can seek to solve all of the problems of this world. But until we as Christians are on our knees with broken and contrite hearts before the cross of Jesus Christ, we will not be within his precious will for our lives. And all of our efforts will be nothing more than filthy rags in the sight of the Lord. Hear me well, it is sheer idiocy for us to say that we're going to win this world for Christ if we're not willing to win our children for God. The battle's locked. The stakes are extremely high. And the entire world is longing to know if we are prepared today for the Armageddon battle of a single soul. We're called upon now to make a choice between the gospel and the gods of this world. We must make the choice to be children of light, as Paul says, and not children of the dark. For you see, to not decide is to decide because God simply has no allowance in his kingdom for any gray areas when it comes to this decision. As we make our decisions, we should at the same time count the cost. For this is a difficult choice, and it is one that may well cost us our fame, our fortunes, and perhaps even our own lives. Nevertheless, it is a choice that must be made because this cup will not pass from our lips. But as Esther, but as with Esther of old, who knows but that we were brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. For if we do not awake now and as Paul says, rise from the dead, we may find ourselves in the same dilemma that Samson found himself in. After Delilah had cut his hair and he was robbed of his strength and the Philistines fell upon him and he went out to do battle and he wist not. that the Lord had departed from him. Lest we lose sight of reality tonight, it is important for us not only to concentrate on what the forces of evil are doing, we also should look closely to what God is doing in our midst. I would be remiss if I did not remind you that in the middle of these evil days, God is still on his throne. And he's still working in our midst. I'm so happy to tell you tonight, I'm so pleased to tell you tonight that God is doing a mighty work at Southern Evangelical Seminary. He has given us a new vision, a new purpose in his kingdom. So I don't want you to be discouraged when you walk in these evil days. For we know that the end time has already been determined and the victory is even now complete. However, it is imperative that we Christ followers seize the challenge of living in these unprecedented times in our nation. If this is indeed the last chance for America, dare we not finish strong and with a flourish for the gospel of Jesus Christ. As the grains of sand filter through the hourglass of our lives, they are being weighed in the balance of heaven's grand scales. The history that is presently being written of Christ's church in America will record whether or not we will be found steadfast in the truth. Abraham Lincoln one time said this. He said, I see the storm rising, and I believe that he has a hand in it. And if perchance God has a place and a part in it for me, then I believe that I am ready. Well, we all should see the storm rising. We all ought to believe that God has a hand in it. And if perchance he has a place or a part in it for any of us, it is my prayer this evening that by the power of Almighty God, 
through the grace imparted to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his only son, that we all will be ready. As for me, standing here before you, I fully understand that I have seen more sunrises than are to come. Many of you have as well. Statistics will tell me that the tragedies unfolding as we speak in our beloved country will actually have a limited effect on me. But you need to hear me. They well may bring untold misery to your children and to your grandchildren. Quite candidly, I can't truthfully stand before you tonight in the total assurance that I am the person that God has chosen to lead Southern Evangelical Seminary at this point of crisis. Nevertheless, I can with all certainty tell you that God has placed a heavy burden deep within my very being. A heavy burden not only for Southern Evangelical Seminary, but for our nation and for our young people. It is a burden for the heart and soul of a land that I love dearly. It is a burden for the heart and soul of its inhabitants that will not be assuaged with mere words. So my heart's prayer tonight as I stand before you, and I hope that it's your prayer as well, that when it comes time for me to lay aside this life, let me be found dressed in God's holy armor, standing steadfast for his truth and seeking to penetrate this culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Of this one thing I am certain though, as I stand before you, I can affirm with great clarity that there is no other better place to impact God's kingdom on this planet that here than here at Southern Evangelical Seminary and Bible College. You know, I have a son-in-law who is a major in the United States Army. And I got this story from him. It goes something like this. During the Battle of the Bulge, an entire U.S. Armored Division was retreating from the German advance in the Ardennes Forest. When a sergeant and a tank destroyer spotted an American infantryman digging a foxhole, that soldier, Private First Class Martin of the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment, looked up and asked the tank commander, are you looking for a safe place to park your tank? Yeah, answered the tanker. Well, buddy, the GI drawled, just pull your vehicle right here in behind me because I'm the 82nd Airborne and this is as far as the enemy's going. Likewise, where the defense of the traditional Christian faith and God's holy Bible and the proclamation of the good news is concerned, the line forms behind Southern Evangelical Seminary. It has now for over 30 years, Miss Barbara. And as long as God gives us life, that's not going to change. I am convinced that there is no other institution in America that is poised to meet the challenge of these evil days more ardently than Southern Evangelical Seminary and Bible College, but we need your help to do so. At SCS, we recognize that we serve a sovereign king. He knows why you're here tonight. He knows 
what's going on in your, and in, in your spirit and your thoughts at this very moment. You were brought here for a reason this evening. And it wasn't just to edify your mind. So I'm simply challenging you. No, no, no I'm, I'm beseeching you this evening. I'm begging you this evening to partner with us in this greatest endeavor for the kingdom of God. As our partner, we need three things from you. We need you to pray for us. I don't know that I have ever felt the presence of demonic spirits more than I have in these last few days and months. So please, please pray for us. We ask you to participate with us. You see volunteers all over the building. Those those folks, or some of them are students, You can participate that way. We need volunteers to come and help. We need folks that will tell other people about where they can go to find good, solid education. We also need you, as you can, to provide for us in any way you can. We're getting ready to close out for this evening. I want you to remember that we got more sessions to come tomorrow, more good speakers, more good information. I hope more good challenges to cause us to go out into our culture and make a difference. So as I close, I just simply say, may God bless each of you. May you bless Southern Evangelical Seminary. And may we all be found faithfully standing in the breach before him for our nation and the world. Stand tall with us. Steadfast in the truth. Penetrating this culture with the gospel message. Thank you so much for coming.